And now we come to number seven in our pantheon of genius. We travel to Germany to investigate a man who is said widely to have the highest IQ on the planet ever. How can this be? And who was he? <laughs> well, I'll tell you right away who he was. He was Wolfgang von Goethe, the German polymath. And the reason why it was assumed and is assumed that he had probably the highest IQ ever relates to his verbal intelligence. If you actually think about the average number of words that the ordinary citizen uses, it is interestingly in conversation only a thousand words with a recognition vocabulary of perhaps 3,000 to 5,000. So use of words, use of language, use of vocabulary is a very important determinant in establishing someone's IQ. That's interesting, actually. Let me just break in here. Yes, absolutely. Verbal intelligence is actually the one that is the basic discourse of life. Correct. We read, we understand, we speak to each other. It is the primary mode of communication. Numbers are very important. But verbal intelligence is the primary means of communication and understanding. So it stands to reason that that should be the yardstick of intelligence. Yes, it is also interesting that when they, they analyse success in standard academia and standard business, it is the people with the biggest vocabulary who tend to dominate. So if you take a good university graduate mm. or a good, well-educated individual, that person will have a, a use vocabulary of perhaps three to 5,000 words and a recognition of 10 to 15, and in really good cases, 20,000 words. What was Shakespeare's? Shakespeare was extraordinary. It was 25,000 words used. 25,000 used, used words. Used words. Mm -hmm. If you look at all the different words that Shakespeare used in all his plays, 25,000. Now, Goethe, are you sitting? Yep. <laughs> I'm holding onto the seatbelt here. Goethe used in his writing 50,000 different words. Twice as many as Shakespeare. Twice as many as Shakespeare. An absolutely extraordinary statistic. I mean, no one has come close to it. In fact, it is a mental world record. The biggest recorded used vocabulary is Goethe with 50,000. Now, not only that, but he was skilled in, in multiple other levels. We've been talking about the polymathic range of skills of the other geniuses. Listen to these of Goethe and compare them with Alexander, with Newton, with Elizabeth, and see how they compare and contrast. He was an athlete. He was a superb dancer. He was a good ice skater. He had a huge personality. He also had a giant head. I mean, he was known for this enormous head of his. Yes, I've been to his house in Jena in Germany, and we saw his top hat there, and I couldn't believe it. It was like a, a cauldron, a huge black cauldron. I couldn't believe that someone had such huge cranial capacity. <laughs> and, and underneath it was this cauldron of thought That's as right. well. He was a doctor and a surgeon. He did work on the bones and the skeleton. That's right. He actually found an entirely new bone, a bone hitherto unknown to science, the intermaxillary bone in the jaw. In the jaw, that's yeah, right. No one knew about it before. Yes, I mean, a, an explorer in medicine. He was a paleontologist. Just like Leonardo. Precisely. And a mineralogist. Yes. Just like Leonardo. He was a botanist. Just, just like, like Leonardo. <laughs> and just like Jefferson. Yes. And he was a, an optician in the sense that he studied optics just like Newton. And colour. He was fascinated by colour. Yes. In fact, he developed his own entire theory of colour and his own theory of botany. He was fascinated by leaves, the structure of leaves. Natural architecture absolutely absorbed him. Yeah, extraordinary. And, and again, very similar to da Vinci in that. He was a soldier. I mean, he was actually a physical fighter. He was a deep and massively thinking philosophical man, so he was a philosopher. He was a qualified lawyer. That was his profession. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Among all these others, he was a statesman and a politician. In fact, he was the Prime Minister of Weimar, the, the Grand Duchy of Weimar, where he was residing. He actually became Prime Minister yes, of it. It's almost as if we're talking about, you know, 20 different people exactly. here. Isn't it all wrapped up in this, with this one giant? He was a novelist, a novel writer, and he was a, uh, a poet a superb and brilliant poet. He was a dramatist. And he not only wrote the plays, he staged them, produced them, yes. directed them. Yeah, I know. I mean, in fact, at that time when he was alive, he was European literature. Absolutely. You know, we say in the movies today, you know, Paul Newman is HUD. <laughs> Goethe was the entire of German literature. Now, I know that when you were a student in school and when you went to Cambridge, you had the option, because of the excellent marks you were getting, of basically studying anything you wanted. And you chose history and German, and within that chose as your specific total focus Goethe. Can you tell us how you first came to be aware of him? 
what actually happened in your mind and why you think he is such a phenomenal genius, apart from some of the things we've already said. Yes, I mean, in fact, it was extraordinary. When I was studying Goethe initially, before I started to go deeply into the topic, I had no idea of all of this stuff. I was not aware of the fact that he was quite so polymathic, quite so various in the things he'd done. I just thought, hey, the poetry sounds good. <laughs> and <laughs> How old were you then? I was about 15 or 16. And we were allowed... Uh, in fact, not allowed, we were obliged to study one play by Goethe at that age. This was Egmont. And this was a play, interestingly, about revolution. It was about the throwing off of Spanish oppression in the Netherlands in the 16th century, at the same time as the Armada and Queen Elizabeth, in fact. Oh, interesting. And this was our first introduction. And we were told that for later exams, it would be advisable to read Goethe's great work, Faust, but only Faust Part 1. Don't try and read Faust Part 2. This was said to be a more advanced work for older men, and we were not to try it. <laughs> and they said, well, there may not even be any questions on Faust Part 1, but you should read it just to get the idea and you know, may give a slight edge over other rival competitors in the exams. So I read Faust Part 1 at the age of 17, and I absolutely fell in love with it. The poetry was colossal. The life vision was amazing. I mean, this was clearly an attempt by Goethe to show the whole of human existence, all his experience. He was Faust. He put himself forwards as the entire representative of the whole gamut of what a human being can experience. Love, hate, death, diabolism, evil, wickedness, learning, aspirations, law, theology, medicine, eventually ending suicide, death, redemption. It was all there. And the poetry grabbed you by the throat. And I remember there's a poem where Faust is on the verge of committing suicide. He thinks he's experienced everything a man can experience. And he says, well, what's left? I'm going to take this vial of poison and go to new shores hitherto unexplored. What is, what is there left? And at that moment, he hears the Easter bells ringing in the background. And suddenly the poetry, as he realises that he hasn't even started to experience life, <laughs> he says, what is this? And you hear this heavenly music in the background. What is this? I've done nothing. How can I think about committing suicide? Slams the vial down, smashes it on the ground, and says, right, tomorrow I really start to live. And this is why he was European literature. At the whole age, we've seen with Jefferson, in America, in Europe, it was an age of revolution, the whole stultifying edifices of the ancien regimes of these catastrophically ossified societies were breaking down. And Goethe picked up this whole tone and energy of revolution and shoveled it straight into his work. The Emperor Napoleon said, as Alexander did about Aristotle and Homer, that he carried Goethe's work round with him, Werther, this novel. It was the only book he took round with him on his campaigns. He said he'd read it seven times. Napoleon, the ultimate revolutionary, the man who smashed the structures of old France, took over Europe, battered down these old bureaucratic armies, and he had Goethe's book in his pocket. That was it. And Goethe expressed this revolutionary fervour. The whole new age of Europe dawned and expressed through Goethe's work. Extraordinary. Now, when you went to Cambridge, I mean, did you get to part two? When did you get to part two? I mean, you were told not to read part two because it was only for men. What happened when you got to part two? I read it immediately. I read part <laughs> one. And then I read part two at once. Now, it's obviously a very difficult work. But in part two, part two is deeper, richer and more complicated. I've given the themes of part one. Part two, we see... Absolutely everything that's left, what is there to do? In part two, Faust part two, we see Goethe, Faust, the scientist. So you're, you're saying that, that Faust is actually Goethe personified? Absolutely, I Faust mean, is Goethe. Now, when we were talking at the beginning of the, the first tape about the normal picture of genius as this somewhat doer or isolated or bent over and antisocial and non-sensual and non-physical... That's right, Goethe is often seen <laughs> very unfairly because he's such a towering figure. It's like Shakespeare. People say, oh, no, not Shakespeare. These people are seen as somehow tall, remote, ossified, boring, distant characters, dull. boring, writing an obscure language, can't be understood, no relation to life, standing in some ivory tower, obiter dicta, handing down pronouncements from the cathedral, etc., etc., etc. Far from it. Goethe was passionate person. He was falling in love all the time with people. Everyone recognised the impressive force, personality of his physique. 
he was perpetually in love, you know, love affairs, escapades all over the place, just like Jefferson. Yes. Expressed through his work, and he suffered passionate agonies of love with beautiful young women all over the place. And he was, you know, physically, as we said, a dancer, a skater. He was, he was you know, a giant in Weimar, you know, a physical, intellectual giant. And in this Faust part two, we see it all. We see not just science, we see Goethe's attempt through Faust to understand what makes the universe tick, how it started. His theory is it started in water. Interesting. Life starts in water. Nobody thought that at the time. People had creationist myths. So he was actually a, a very good scientist as well Absolutely. as being this he, giant he, writer. He says, and uh, uh, Act 2 of Faust Part 2, that 